everybody, and welcome to our panel, New Marketing Horizons in the Metaverse. I am Lisa Payton, and I am so grateful and thrilled to be joining you today. And we have an amazing panel, and I can't wait to get into a very lively discussion today about marketing in the metaverse. So first of all, I'm going to quickly introduce myself. Um, as I said, I'm Lisa Payton. Um, I've been in the immersive media and experiential marketing space for almost 20 years, um, early adopter of this technology, and now I'm thrilled to see it finally kind of coming to the fore uh, within our campaigns. And so uh, I currently teach this stuff at the University of Oregon. I'm a professor down there, and I'm also a consultant for large technology companies who are looking to innovate their campaigns with these types of emerging technologies. Um, so without further ado, I want to get right into it. I'm going to go ahead and have the panelists um, go ahead and introduce themselves and let them talk about their connection to XR and the metaverse and marketing. And why don't I toss it over to Olivier, my friend, uh, if you'd like to go first, that would be awesome. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, very, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so I'm Olivier Moinjon. I'm co-founder of Exclusible. We are a uh, Web3 uh, immersive and innovation studio based uh, between Europe, the US, the Middle East, and now we also have a presence in Shanghai. Uh, so we're, we're very global. And, uh, and so our experience in um, you know, XR, immersive, and, and applied to marketing uh, spans across multiple different functions. Uh, we have launched a multitude of NFT projects. That was the first version of our company. And then we really expanded uh, through the acquisition of our 3D studio. And now we build uh, immersive experiences. We started in the metaverse. Uh, pretty much any platform that you can think of from Sandbox, Decentraland to Spatial. And now where we are, we're going very deep into gaming, especially Roblox and Fortnite. And when it comes to the metaverse, we build white label immersive 3D for brands and corporations. Awesome. Thank you. That was wonderful. Sure. Catherine, why don't you share yeah. next? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Catherine Oaks and I am the founder and CEO of Slice XR. Slice is first a marketing and branding agency because everything starts with branding, right? We have to make sure that we are positioning our companies and our brand the right way. And this has evolved dramatically over the past couple of years because of the metaverse. And this is what we do at Slice XR. We really help propel brands into the next generation. And the next generation is now having different types of needs. They want immersive experiences. They want to, they want, they don't want to be sold. They, they want to be taken by the hand and, and live an experience that's going to, to give them hope again, that's given them energy to try new products. So this is what we do. We really help position brands so that their communication now is relevant to the new generation, of course, of course, to everyone, but to the new generation in particular, because they are looking for XR, AR, VR, all these technologies that are going to present them products and services in a completely different light. So this is what we do at Slice. We help brands recreate messaging that is relevant and create experiences that are going to help them grab market shares and position themselves in a new light compared to their competitors. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. And Neil, you're up. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Neil Savadas. I am not directly in the metaverse marketing space, but my perspective is more so as a voice for Gen Z in the tech world. I work on the product side at an entertainment platform. I'm also a writer, speaker, and founder of the Find Gen Z series, which is a newsletter at the intersection of emerging tech, social media, and Gen Z. Uh, and I think my goal on my side and my perspective is really about with all these amazing godlike technologies we have nowadays with social media, search engines, AI, smartphones, XR, VR. My whole perspective is I want to make sure we're building products that are built with the human interest rather than the human weakness. Yeah, I love that, Neil. And I'm so grateful to have you in the room because I think so many of these activations are targeting, you know, this this younger Gen Z generation. And so having your perspective on the panel is so valuable. So let's dive right in here to let's start off with this first question, which is um, where are brands seeing success today? 
uh, when it comes to kind of emerging technologies and marketing in the metaverse. Um, you know, Gucci just launched a new activation. Maybe you all saw that in the sandbox. I was excited to read about that. And Olivia, again, I'm just going to maybe start with you because I know that luxury brands are very near and dear to your heart. And I would love for you to share your perspective on that question. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe first of all, we can start with a little bit of a, a history or a recap of the past two and a half years, because so much has happened and the space has evolved so much. So just to make sure we're talking about the same things. So the hype around the metaverse uh, came in like 2021 when uh, Facebook renamed to Meta. Of course, the metaverse is nothing new. This concept of like an immersive 3D um, internet, you know, virtual worlds, virtual stores, they've been around for years and years and years. And many studios, many people have been working on these technologies for a long time. Then there was the hype. Post-meta announcements, all the metaverse platforms that were deeply uh, Web3 connected usually had a token um, and were destinations. So <clears throat> what I call destination, it's like a platform where you go. So it's not white label. Those platforms are supposed to have some type of community, uh, native and so that's the great interest for brands or anyone to build on those platforms is that to leverage the existing community so we had a very strong hype uh, late 2021 early 2022 uh, for these platforms fast forward to today i think that space has changed dramatically and the reality is that brands they want brand and corporations uh, you know that's really our core uh, focus in terms of target clients. Uh, what they want is either to go on gaming platforms that are already that already have millions and millions of users, okay, or they want to create their own immersive experience uh, so that they can tap into virtual commerce. They can re 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 inject storytelling and creativity on their website. Anything that's in between, I think, has fallen a little bit out of the radar and out of grace. Uh, from brands and corporations, which are now really looking for something long-term with a clear ROI. Uh, you can take all your marketing metrics, your sales metrics from your traditional channels. <clears throat> now, if they are investing in immersive experiences, they are looking also for, for metrics. And the reality is that the gaming platforms offer very, very strong audience. It's a fantastic way to tap into a younger audience. You can generate revenue. You're building awareness uh, today for the client of tomorrow. And if you build something on your website, you control the environment 100%. And you are basically adding a new layer to the millions of dollars that as a brand, you are already spending in digital marketing to drive traffic to your website. So I think these are really the, the two realities of today. Uh, then, of course, there are so many different technologies that really are interesting from a, a marketing, like innovation marketing point of view, and like AR, VR, XR, um, you know, uh, out of house, uh, you know, fan engagements, like all sorts of things that we can probably dig into a little bit further. <clears throat> yeah, that's awesome, Olivier. That that perspective is um, is great, kind of level setting. And Catherine, I'd love for you to share your perspective on on this question of where brands are seeing um, kind of driving some, some good results with immersive. Yeah, yeah. what I can tell you is uh, the sectors, the industries, the verticals that are most active using those new technologies. And I have a list here, architecture. Architectural exploration is huge. We are working with clients all over the world that are finding new ways now to first uh, develop projects on, in a 3D environment so that they can showcase their own clients how, for example, a building is going to look in, in a specific environment and take them on a journey. I mean, recreate the building in a 3D space and allow them to visit that building as if it was already finalized. So, so that is becoming more and more popular and it's gaining traction and we're getting a lot of demands in that area. Interior design is the same thing. Now you can really cre recreate a, a home in a 3D environment like it's already done. So imagine the, um, the sales journey is happening a lot faster because people see in front of their eyes in a 3D setting what they would buy, right? So that has been very popular, very successful. A product customization, 
people and teams can meet from all over the world and together work at developing product in a 3D setting. Same thing, it's, it's something that industries, a lot of industries love to be able to do. And uh, I have seen the medical field getting more involved in that, pharmaceutical companies getting more interested in that because it allows them to work together in, in an immersive setting that is a lot more prone to innovation, first of all. Uh, it speeds up the, the production process and it, it, it creates an environment that is completely new, therefore, uh, like I mentioned before, prone to create innovation to a completely new level. Product driving experiences within the car industry also are very interested in using uh, 3D experiences to, to give their prospects uh, an experience of, hey, you can drive your car now come into the metaverse, drive your car, or, or test a prototype of a car, and then you can get a, give us feedback. Same thing. There's a lot of lot going on in that, that area. Uh, inter, interactive mirrors for the fashion industry. These are also growing in, uh, in interest and demand, uh, as well as virtual training. You know, B2B, B2C, virtual training in a 3D space, that also is very effective. And I'm starting to see a lot more companies that, that want to leverage those technologies to, to enhance communication between their different stakeholders. And of course, mocap and virtual production with games combined together, it can be very powerful to not only educate, um, but also to, to generate a, a gaming environment that is um, very inspiring, very entertaining, but also that provides a, a powerful interaction as far as uh, business growth uh, that has been very successful and, and a lot of demand in that area as well. So as you can see, lots of the diversity of industries are getting now very interested, they're starting to invest. And uh, it's exciting to see that happening because it's gonna change the, the business landscape for sure. Yeah, I love that, Catherine. And you just rattled off so many wonderful use cases um, where you know brands are seeing some traction with this technology. And Neil, I'm going to go to you and I'm going to kind of flip this a little bit. Um, being kind of the, the Gen Z rep in the room, where are you seeing Gen Z engaging with these types of technologies, kind of this intersection of brand and immersive? And what is effectively reaching that audience? Yeah, absolutely. So I think in regards to the metaverse, you know, we talk a lot about like gaming and entertainment. And I would say even among Gen Z, there's probably like two, I would say, groups to really think about. I mean, one is really those people who are passionate gamers. You know, you could say, I think there's a stat like, you know, 3 billion people on earth are, are would identify as gamers. Um, but I think there is a smaller seg subsegment of that that are really, you know, passionate about it, happy to be in these immersive worlds and stuff like that. And then there's the other, I think, segment that is more so, I think, a bit more skeptical of these technologies, right? Like, kind of sick and tired of all these godlike technologies that have taken over their lives, social media, smartphones, et cetera, that I mentioned before. And I think it takes a bit more skepticism with them because, you know, they're kind of exhausted by it. The average, I think, teen nowadays sees 10,000 pieces of content per day. And so like they can spot ads from mile away. They can spot, you know, brand activations from mile away. And they're very skeptical about it. And I would say, actually, the biggest thing you can do uh, when, let's say, you're you know marketing, like, say, a brand in the metaverse or in like worlds like Roblox, et cetera, is to really make it more about entertainment and bringing joy rather than trying to sell anything really. Cause you know, Gen Z sees so many ads per day and the number one thing you can do for your brand that really makes an impact is to really try to associate it with joy. And that's, you know, with things like humor, with fun, with gamification, that really makes it easy for people to be like, oh, you know, like I saw this brand in the metaverse, I saw Nike land, I saw, you know, McDonald's in activation, this year where they built a metaverse around Chinese New Year, you know, they're kind of just making it fun, right? Making it more engagement. I think in terms of ROI, that's a whole nother question. I think given that such a, it's like it's such a new industry of metaverse marketing, it's much harder to measure. So I think now is really a time to kind of, I think, embrace this idea of really trying to entertain your Gen Z users more so than trying to sell to them because they are kind of sick and tired of all this marketing that they grew up with. Yeah, I love that. And you just are really speaking to so many of my students uh, are, are in that latter group where, you know, they are just 
leaped out on technology and they they feel they're just kind of done mm -hmm. with it. So what an interesting challenge to have now is, you know, it's digital marketers trying to figure out how to make digital work. Um, so let's talk a little bit about specific strategies and tactics. And I love, Neil, that you just spoke to ROI. Maybe we can bring that into the to this question as well. So maybe specifically you can talk about wh what types of strategies um, are working and bringing brands that positive ROI and what are they measuring, right? It, you know, it may not be direct sales. Maybe it's more like brand lift or brand loyalty. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that. How are brands measuring ROI and where are they seeing the lift that they want? What types of strategies and tactics are driving that? And Olivier or Catherine, whoever wants to go first on that one, it's up to you. Uh, I can go first if you want. Well, first of all, it's PR. They're going to start getting PR. Uh, interest from the media, they're going to come to them. And that's a great way to get free PR. Right? PR can be expensive, but when you create something or when you work on something that nobody else in your industry is working on, and if you speak enough about this on social media, of course, you have to let people know about it you may get some interest from the media. So, so that's, that's return on investment right away because it has huge amounts of value. And engagement, engagement on social media. We see a lot of this, people ask questions. What is this? Why are you doing this? You know, what, what are the benefits of that? And, and how is it going to help your company? So I think this, these are the two initial ways of measuring uh, success and return on your investment. Is that PR and social media engagement? Awesome. Thanks, Catherine, for that response. Uh, Olivier, I would love to get your perspective on that same question. Yes, absolutely. So I think it's very important uh, at the inception of a project with a, a brand, we need to agree on what the objectives are. Is it Are they building some type of innovative, immersive project for conversion, for brand awareness, for client acquisition? And then uh, we establish baseline metrics against which we are going to measure the success of the performance. Uh, in everything we do, we know that, for example, white label metaverse usually converts much better than e-commerce. Um, you know, maybe like 30% increase in conversion, 70% 70, 70 increase in uh, coming back to the website. So all the standard metrics improve. Then, of course, the, the difference is in terms of traffic. So traffic, especially if you have an immersive experience on your website as a brand, you might not have the same amount of traffic as your standard website um, because only a portion of that traffic will go and visit and spend time to visit your experience. But one thing for sure is that any type of immersive experience usually has a much, much longer dwell time compared to standard social media or uh, standard e-commerce websites. Uh, so, for example, we did an experience with Sour Patch Kids you know, very famous candy brand by the Mondelez group. And we know that we have uh, almost 2 million minutes spent in the experience in uh, just two weeks. So in terms of time spent and engagement is absolutely massive compared to what they get on regular uh, channels. And without any type of marketing, um, we had almost 200,000 visits in two weeks. And that's on Roblox. OK, that's an experience that we built on Roblox. So that's also the power of these new platforms that uh, have been there for many years, but brands are just starting to pay attention. And these are becoming new channels. I think that for all of these new channels, we need to establish also the new metrics, what good looks like, what are standard metrics that will be accepted and, and benchmarked against. Uh, moving forward, because my take is that every single company, every single brand in the next two to five years will have a gaming experience, whether on Roblox, Fortnite, Zepeto, and they will have immersive 3D on their website. That's an absolute certainty. And we're going towards there and we're building all of this ecosystem at the moment. You just said the Z word. You just said Zepeto. That's, oh. oh, yes. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Oh, um, anyway, uh, great, great. Thank you for that answer, Olivier. And I, um, I'd like to just, uh, uh, and you'll kind of, I'll bring you into this next question. But I'd like to queue up kind of this next um, question, which because both of you, Catherine and Olivier, are talking about specific 
use cases that I think span both kind of consumer focusing um, activations and then also B2B activations. We think about some of the kind of architectural examples and things that you brought up, Catherine. So talk to us about the audiences and it's because it's not, I think if I were a brand, maybe they didn't know a lot about this, I think, oh, this is just for the young, which is just for consumers trying to reach gamers. But I don't think that's the case anymore. And so if you could share um, a little bit about maybe, you know, the audience is being engaged. Talk a little bit about B2B, B2C activations and what mm-hmm. those types of brands are doing. Um, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, well, it depends on the industry, of course. So you, you, you're going, for example, the pharmaceutical world can target B2C consumers or, or businesses. So it depends on their goals. If their goal is to uh, do research together and bring together specialists and scientists and doctors, that's, that's a great way to, to do it, to use those immersive technologies and, and bring people into, um, into a room in a virtual space uh, using different types of technologies to, to uh, innovate and work together for research purposes. For consumers, that's, that's a great way to educate about a new uh, medication, for example, right? So you bring people into a journey. Instead of seeing those ads that we see always on TV that are absolutely, absolutely obnoxious, nobody wants to see that anymore. You just present that in a completely different light and therefore you draw some interest back. So, so that's one way to do it, medical, pharmaceutical, of course, you know, B2C and B2B. Uh, so it's and, and as far as age is concerned, you can reach the young ones as far as the elderly. You know, uh, on, on, in the metaverse, you have platforms that are specialized for seniors, and they flock to the to the metaverse. And you would have never known that when I tell that to some of my clients. And you know, you can reach the the older generation as well. And why is that? Is because they are isolated. And those new technologies allow them to not be isolated anymore. They, they now, thanks to, of course, they have to have goggles, but they now can, can find themselves into an environment where we gather together, we play games together. You can introduce products and services to them in a light that's completely different. And then you can get ref- referrals like that. You can get reviews, testimonials. You, you can have live testimonials. This is the power of the metaverse as well bring people together in a space, in a 3D space, talk about a product in a non-salesly fashion, and then generate reviews from that. You use those videos, my God, that's UGC, that's powerful. So the, you, you can generally use, uh, reach any audiences, any age with any type of content, as long as it's done in an innovative way, as long as it's interesting, and as long as it's professional. Right, professional and say professional, it has to be done right because people time is always an issue. People don't have huge amounts of time. So make your message short to the point, engaging and fun. Hey, and then you will you you will make some space, then you will reach more and more people and they will remember you, which is the other thing that's really important is if you do those things well, they will remember you because most companies are not present there anymore. Not anymore. They are not yet present there. That's the way I wanted to say. Catherine, can you share the specific platforms where you would market to the elderly? Which ones are you talking about? Uh, well, Meta. In Meta, you have lots of different apps. And I know a lot of them. That are Meta really... Horizons? Meta Horizons? We, we, yes, in Horizon World. Correct. So that's where a lot of the seniors are flocking right now in Horizon World, where they, they can find different apps and, and meet with people. So that's one of them. You know, we, we, even with Roblox, I mean, you get games. Some people, were, even if they are 75, 80 years old, they love to play games. So they go into Roblox and, and they meet people that way. So that, that's the thing that I think industries and companies and brands have to understand is that behaviors are changing. Behaviors are changing and have changed dramatically over the past two years, first of all, because of COVID. We were forced to change our behavior because of COVID. And now this now is, has been ingrained into the way we live our lives. So instead of thinking, hey, we have ne- never done it this way, this does not work, they now have to open up their minds and think differently because everything's changed. And that's what I'm challenged with the more and more is people tell me, oh, this is not going to work. Oh. This has never been done this way. You're right. And if you don't adjust, you will lose your market shares. That's as simple as that. It's going to happen. People have to think differently, be open-minded, 
and, and realize that they can reach a, wide, a much broader audience if they start behaving that way. Yeah. And Olivia, I see you nodding your head. Do you want to also kind of jump in and talk about audience segmentation and I, kind of the B2B, B2C discussion when it comes to the metaverse? Uh, sure. So obviously, uh, the metaverse, the reality is that it's gaming. Okay. Those are game gaming mechanics, gaming type of environments. So it caters to a uh, usually a younger audience. Uh, of course, each platform has a specific audience. So Roblox, you know, uh, half of the players on Roblox are below 13 years old, which then creates all sorts of uh, challenges for brands because there's a way that you can limit, you, you can uh, prevent your uh, experience to be available for below 13 or below 17 on Roblox. Um, and then 14% um, of uh, the audience on Roblox is considered adult. So it's above uh, 17. Okay. Whereas on Fortnite, the large majority is 17 to 35 years old, but they are also mostly men. Whereas on Roblox, the split female to male, it's uh, almost close to 50%, 50 50. And uh, I think Neil was talking about the overall gaming audience, which is 3 billion people, 3 billion per day, I think, play games on, uh, on average. Um, and that split also at the total level video gaming, it's, uh, I think, 45% female. And there's a very nice distribution throughout age groups. So basically, it, it depends on the platform. It depends on the platform. It depends on, on where people are going to join this experience and also the type of communities. But of course, the, 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 the interest for brands is omnichannel. That's what it is about. And brands have been implementing omnichannel strategies for years, usually linking their stores to e-commerce, uh, making all that connections very seamless so that it's, it's a frictionless experience for customers. Now, what we are saying to them, to the brands, is that gaming and all these metaverse platforms and metaverse experiences should also be part of their omnichannel strategies and there are ways to connect what you will do in the experience or a roblox video game to your stores to your to the physical expression of your brand or even to your e-commerce there are many different bridges that we can discuss but brands like chipotle or mcdonald's have done that type of uh, o2o so uh, online to offline or vice versa um, activations, and they have been very successful doing so. Yeah, I love that, Olivier. Thank you for sharing. And Neil, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask you. And uh, and my, let me ask you about the the younger audience and their gaming habits because I feel as though um, kind of this segment, if you will, of gamers has really evolved over the last ten years. Um, I. You know, from my days at Intel when I was working with enthusiast gamers, you know, who really needed to have that high-end PC to do gaming, you know, console gaming, it's all changed with the advent of mobile gaming. And now we've got, you know, mobile 3D spaces like Roblox. Talk to us about kind of the segment of gaming and how that's evolved from being what we used to kind of the stereotypical, you know, guy in the basement to what it is now, which is Olivier was hitting on. It's a much more diverse population um, than it used to be. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is an innate human thing of like <clears throat> entertainment. And I think nowadays with like, I would say the creation of platforms like TikTok, for example, that are really discovery driven, it's really opened the door for other audiences to come into this segment and realize, hey, like I have value in this, I can enjoy gaming, et cetera. And so um, whether it's different genders, different communities coming in and being like, oh, you know, I thought gamers used to be this certain way. Um, what but also you have to realize that, you know, I think there's an innate ability within the gaming industry that is very inviting in general, like even the guy in the basement, right, who used to play with his friends, like the the reason why so many people, for example, they'll, you know, go on, you know, PlayStation or Xbox with their friends, uh, you know, every night of the week, but won't hang out in person is because that it, like the, the experience of like talking to someone, you know, over like the Xbox or the PlayStation while playing while doing activity that is uh, honestly as 
human as it gets. It, you know, it feels like they're there in person. That's probably even the the I think vision of what VR is trying to get to. And I would say to go a step further in terms of like answering question, even about you know what kind of things should brands be doing to build these immersive and experiential marketing questions, and what kind of questions they should be asking in order to kind of define a, a, a successful campaign. I'd say there's two really important things to consider. Number one, does your campaign really bring in a human insight into it of like, this is, you know, is the virtual world making the human world, the real, the real world, a better experience? One example is with the NBA is now, you know, broadcasting uh, games through VR headsets where you can literally sit courtside and watch the game live through a VR headset. You know, that there's millions of people who probably never sat courtside at an NBA game, but would l- love to. And they now, they now have the opportunity to through VR. And then the second thing is also, I would say, number two, is this something that is socially shareable? Like, is this something that, you know, if my friend did this or my mom or my daughter did this, like, would I want to do this as well? Because I think a great example in this gamified world that is unbelievable is Fortnite. And the fact that Fortnite, the majority, I think, of its revenue, actually, it's a free game. The majority of the revenue actually comes from buying skins, like buying clothes for digital avatars, which just sounds really crazy that I think the number was really almost into the billions of like money made from that particular thing. But the reason why it wasn't because they were like marketing these skins of like, oh, you should buy this. It was more so, you know, like one person, like someone's what your friend bought it. You bought this skin for, you know, this, uh, you know, LeBron themed skin, et cetera. And then you had to have it as well. And I think those two questions of like, is there a human insight into this that makes the virtual world arguably better than the real world? And two, is this something that is socially shareable, something that, you know, the next person word of mouth will want to bring into their own lives as well? Thanks, Neil. That's great. I just want you to say thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate everybody. Nice to meet everyone. And yes. if you need more information, you can go to slicexr.com. And we're really here, here to, to help brands establish a presence in the metaverse and not be scared. And we guide them. We guide them so that we can do this more efficiently. That's awesome. basically Thank- Great. Thanks, Catherine. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, well, I'm noticing uh, that we have about 10 minutes left to this discussion. And so I want to encourage everybody that's watching. First of all, thank you so much for, for joining and, and, and watching uh, this discussion. But please go ahead and share any questions. Um, we would love to be able to kind of share our expertise in the most valuable way possible with those of you that are attending. So let us know what your questions are um, in chat and we'll be happy to, to answer those. Um, so let's, I want to kind of round things out with uh, a very popular topic these days, which is generative AI, this little thing called ChatGPT that uh, has just taken the world by storm. And like every industry, it's impacting not only marketing, but it's really impacting kind of XR and immersive marketing. Um, And so I'd love to get both Neil and Olivier, your perspective, and then I might share my own perspective as I've been doing a lot of work in this area too, on what you are seeing in terms of AI impacting um, experiential marketing and these experiences that we're all, you know, building. Sure. Um, ha- happy to start. Uh, so, of, of course, it's uh, an incredible time uh, to witness the birth of Gen AI. Uh, in our company, we have used it since the very first uh, days that it came out. Uh, and now with the recent release of all the updates uh, with ChatGPT and, and the announcement by OpenAI, uh, it's even more, uh, it, it re- it's really accelerating the way we are adopting the technology. So one thing for us, um, we're using the technology to accelerate and to bring efficiency. We're just, it, it's a productivity tool. We're just doing things faster and better. It's not at all replacing anything that a human was doing before. We start with AI and then humans, like all our team members, are uh, completing, finalizing, editing. Uh, It's just a productivity tool. So we use it a lot at the studio level. Uh, When we build an immersive world, whether it's Roblox or a metaverse experience, uh, very often our designers start um, creating uh, images um, using different platforms. So we use multiple ones, uh, you know, Mid Journey, Dali, uh, you know, Runway sometimes. Um, 
And so it's, it's the start of validating a creative direction. And then in 3D, all our developers and designers will basically finalize and, and, and build what the AI has uh, started off. Um, on the commercial side, it's very interesting. We actually built our own chat GPT bot and we're able to create uh, customized uh, presentations for our clients much, much faster. So it was almost impossible in the past if we wanted to send uh, a prospect or a client a presentation showing, hey, you should, this is what you could build, this is the type of games you could do. Uh, if we wanted to personalize that, it had to be done by hand, you know, manually. Now we have built basically a logic and a bot that can do that for us in like five minutes. So in terms, it's also better to visualize uh, the possibilities of immersive worlds um, at a time when all of these new technologies are still obscure, obscure and not um, mastered or understood by the people we, we speak with, usually innovation teams, which are more advanced, but very often it's a marketing team, brand side, and they are as much in the, in the dark as we were maybe a year, two years, three years ago. So Gen AI has been really a big game changer for us. Uh, copy is another aspect, of course, um, you know, copywriting, any types of content creation. Uh, we use it literally on a daily basis, all of us in the, in the team. Yeah, I love that, Olivia. I do too. Um, and Neil, I'll go ahead and get your perspective on this. We have a few minutes left. What, how are you seeing AI impact, uh, impacting us um, and, and marketing and campaigns? Yeah, absolutely. I think generative AI, there is a lot of, you know, hype, also a lot of concern about it, which is also something I'm very passionate about um, in terms of, you know, making sure we're with a very, very powerful tool, how we use it right. But I think in terms of how it really can help with marketing, I think it's really two ways. So I like, I like to use this term of there's, you know, free digital real estate, whether that's social media, web pages, et cetera, that a lot of, you know, brands have, for example. And Combining that with Gen, Gen AI can be a very powerful tool because a lot of times previously, you know, marketing, you'd have to sit in the boardroom and figure out, you'd kind of have to guess like, oh, what do what does our audience want to see from us? But what you can do instead now is with this free real estate is put little things out there, right? Like see, you know, like try out this idea on social media along with like five other ideas, see which one gets the most engagement and then go build, you know, your immersive world or your activation from there based on, you know, what works and what doesn't from that little testing you have on that free real estate. And with Gen AI, what you can do with that is, you know, do that at scale. So you can, you know, build many different versions, whether that's copy, whether that's images, whether that's you know, a whole wide range of things and test those things out before doing these larger brain activations that previously you would just, you know, throw it as a shot in the dark and hope it would, hope, and hope it would work. So I think that's really the biggest benefit on, like you could say, the, the business side or our side as marketers. And then also I think with Gen AI, it's this idea of personalization that Olivier mentioned. I think with all these consumers, you know, what's better than having an experience that's completely tailored to us? Whether, you know, we all have different uh, versions of, you know, how we use different platforms, how we maybe we see the world. And with that data we have on everyone, it can be used for good and bad, but overall it can really make it, you know, as customized as possible in terms of, you know, when I'm navigating the metaverse, what kind of even brand activation I want to see uh, from a certain brand or what kind of, you know, game I'd, I'd play within a activation in like Roblox or, or the metaverse. So I think those two things really making it more efficient to help, you know, use it as a testing ground for that free real estate you have. And then also the personalization of the actual user themselves in terms of how they experience the world. Because I think we all have different perspectives about how we'd want to experience these experiences. And I think Gen AI is a very optimistic way of doing that. But again, you know, we want to make sure that it's meant to there, it's meant to heighten the human experience rather than harm it. And I think that's really at the end of the day what also matters as well. Olivia, did you have a hand up or is that a yes, yes, yes. Oh. Because Neil made me think of, of something when I was listening to him. Um you know, there has been a few examples of ad campaigns purely generated by AI. I think the brands uh, Casablanca, Revolve, they launch 100% AI campaigns. And I think that's it's a great use of the technology. Uh, the difficulty is when the, the conversation then goes away from, hey, it's an amazing tech, to, hey, 
you're putting people out of business because those campaigns were in the past made by an entire team uh, between renting the studios, the hiring the models, the photographers, the stylists, etc. Um, and uh, I think it's Levi's uh, who did something also that completely backfired uh, when they did an entire um, they did um, you know uh, AI models. Uh, to show a very wide range of uh, inclusion and diversity and it backlash because people said, well, then just go and hire diverse mod models, you know, instead of creating them using AI. So I think it's very legitimate to have that type of concerns. Um, right now, we are still in the phase where everybody is navigating the technology. Uh, it's not going, it's, it's, it's here to stay for a very long time and it, it will only improve over time. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's a balance of finding the right um, combination of the input from the machine, from the tech, uh, just to accelerate and help also unleash creativity, uh, especially you know, for designer, for all the marketing teams. So it's a support, it's an assistance, it's, uh, it's an accelerator rather than a, a replacement. Yeah, and I'm going to add on. I agree with everything that, that you all just said. Um, productivity, yes. Um, the t one thing that I wanted to talk about that maybe isn't talked about enough is it absolutely helps with creativity as well and, and voice of the customer. And one very compelling way that I'm using ChatGPT on a daily basis is with my customer companion that I've created. I've created my AI persona using ChatGPT. I have one for all my different customers that could be students that I'm trying to reach in the classroom to um, anybody that I'm reaching through my marketing campaign, what maybe it's a CMO, maybe what, who, whomever they are. I have these beautiful personas and they are, are live voice of customers. So I can go and ask them what kind of image would help draw your attention to a blog post about X? What do you actually want to see a blog post about? And it will give you the most amazing answers. Um, it's just at your fingertips. So there's no excuse anymore if you're a marketer to not have your finger on the pulse of your customer period um everybody should be using it in that way every company if they're not already i know some companies are closer to the voice of customer than others but this is an amazingly powerful tool because all of those personas are based upon the reams of data that are actually existing out there these aren't it's not like they're making it up i mean it's such an amazing use as well because it's internal so some of these concerns that you have about you know incorrect facts or going off the rails. And that doesn't matter because you're, it's an internal thing, right? We're not showing that to the customer per se. So when we think about building strategies and, and creativity and the way we approach things, there's a lot of room for a tool like ChatGPT to come into that mix. Um, and I know we have to wrap up. I wanna just share some resources. Um, so we are gonna take your questions, uh, a couple of resources to follow up. So I um, have an XR AI marketing brief that comes out twice a month that talks about all this yummy stuff um, with lots of opportunities to meet. I do a monthly online XR pub crawl for marketers, just like y'all who are interested in bringing this type of technology into your campaign. So please join me live. Um, I have an AI marketing revolution challenge that is a YouTube hands-on tutorial challenge. I've got about 10. I will have 10. I think there's five up there now where if you really want to get your hands in and like learn how to build a customer companion and learn how to use ChatGPT and other AI tools to really help you today in being creative and effective in your campaigns, go ahead and check that out. Um, it's all on LinkedIn. You'll find everything there. So just do Lisa Payton on LinkedIn and all of the good stuff is there. And before we go, I want um, to give both Olivier and Neil a chance to, to sign off. Um, and so uh, Olivier, why don't you go ahead and jump in? Any last words before I know we have to wrap this up? No, thank you again. I love your idea, what you were describing about creating personas. That's very, very smart. I didn't think of doing that. Um, and no, I only encourage... Um, so if you are a brand or a corporation, just think that what's happening today, everything we talked about, gaming, immersive, all these new technologies, it's the same as uh, me, us, pitching you social media in like 2008, 2010, and telling you that you have to open an Instagram account for your, for your company or your brand. Uh, it's the same, okay? It's a new channel. You don't understand it now. You don't see the value, but in a few years, it's going to be an absolute, absolutely obvious. And everybody, every brand is going to have one, you know. Love that, Olivier. Neil, yeah. take us out. Take us out. What do you got? Absolutely. So I think for marketers, I would definitely challenge everyone 
to really think about with these new technologies that have come out and these new platforms to really think about, you know, how you can ensure that there's still, I think, a human element to, you know, the insights and, and the campaigns and that's not necessarily just about, you know, gimmick, gimmicky technology, et cetera, stuff like that. Really think about, you know, where is the human element that you're still using for your campaigns and ensuring that, you know, even though we are moving to a more like digital, uh, a world where digital and reality kind of come together, really think about how you can, you know, bring out the the human elements there within your marketing campaigns, within your products, et cetera. Awesome. Thank you, Deal. And thanks, everybody. I know I'll see some of you in my AI Masterclass that's coming up right here at this conference, I think right after this. So I can't wait to get you all in and talk more about the AI Customer Companion and all the amazing tools that I've been learning um, along with everybody over the last, you know, several months. Um, we're here for questions. And thank you so much for your time. Um, again, we're here. If you have any questions, you can always hit me up on LinkedIn and happy to share. And I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. It's definitely something we're all very passionate about. So thank you. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.